Good morning. Well, I was going to say another throwback Sunday, unplanned, but I guess we're back and God is good. Um, next Sunday, uh, me and uh, Alex is in the back, and then we're supposed to have another uh, young man who actually just graduated high school. His name is Ben, uh, joining us on the mission trip, so if you would keep us in your prayers. Uh, we'll be here next Sunday in the morning, but then we'll be hitting the road during the worship service to head to Louisville. So if you could be praying for us, that would be great. Who are the people that you listen to? The people that when they speak, you sit up at attention and make sure that you catch the words that they say. Maybe it's a parent, a friend, a boss, a work, uh, a boss at work, or a teacher. Uh, whoever it is, what is it about that person that makes you listen? We make lots of decisions in our lives and really throughout the course of an entire day. I'm confident in saying that you woke up this morning because you are here. Uh, you made the decision to get out of bed this morning. You made the decision on the clothes that you wore. Uh, you made the decision to wear clothes, which is a good decision. <laughs> you made the decision to come to church today. Deciding to listen to someone is a choice that we're making. At times, we are told to listen to someone. Maybe we're told by a parent, listen to me, because I said so. But we still make a choice to listen. There seems to be consistent things that make us choose to listen to a person. We listen to people that we like, people that we respect, people that know their stuff, people that have something to teach us and to offer us. Think about when somebody introduces a guest speaker. They list off that person's accomplishments, maybe some ways that they're connected to the audience. Uh, for example, you know, if I came back to speak at RTHS, they might tell them that he's a 2005 graduate of the school to let the audience know that he uh, relates to you. He knows the th things that you go through. In a short amount of time, they have to answer the question in your mind, why should I give this person my attention? My high school football coach was a guy that I listened to. And why did I listen? He had experience. He knew what he was talking about. He demonstrated that he wanted me to be a better football player. He took some interest in getting to know me other than just football. When he addressed the team, he had my attention because of all these things, including he held us accountable, which made me respect him. Today's passage includes a powerful scene when God steps in and audibly speaks to the, uh, the disciples specifically saying to listen to Jesus. Now, that's an amazing moment, but in this passage, it leaves me with a big question. Why should we listen to Jesus? We're told to, but why should we? Let's go to our scripture in Luke chapter 9, starting with verse 28. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. Now, before we go any further, the first question that I have is, eight days after Jesus said what? So that feels important. If we go back to the passage that Pastor read last week, right after Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus says that he must suffer many things and be rejected by the important people of society. He says he is going to be killed and then raised on the third day. He talks about how we must be willing to follow him and lay down our lives, lay down ourselves. And he even says that some standing there would not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Now, about eight days later, I imagine the disciples have been thinking and talking about everything that Jesus said, wondering what he meant, wondering what he was talking about. Now, the Mark and the Matthew version of this passage specifically say after six days this happened. About a week's time had passed since Jesus dropped some significant information on the disciples. Now, a little later in the passage, we'll see that Moses is a part of this scene. The six days in the Mark and the Matthew passage may tie to the six days that Moses waited after God had told him to come up to the mountain and receive the tablets of stone. On the seventh day, God called to Moses. Now, that was a significant moment in God's story of the redemption of his people. Here again, we see a period of about a week passing before another significant moment in the story of God's redemption of his people. Also, Jesus wasn't alone, right? It says Peter, John, and James uh, went with him. Now, they didn't just happen to be there. They weren't just 
tagging along, but Jesus intentionally took them. And so I say, why these three? They seem to be his inner circle. Uh, They were taken with Jesus in Luke chapter 8 when he went to the house of Jairus, a synagogue ruler, and raised his dead daughter back to life. Those three were there. Uh, They were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus went off to pray before being arrested and led off to his trial and his crucifixion. Those three were there. Peter, James, and John witnessed some of the most amazing moments of Jesus' life. Jesus taking these three tells me that something significant is coming. The scene demonstrates why we should listen to Jesus. Verse 29 reads, As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Now, I don't really have the words to do the glory of God and the glory of Jesus justice. But what I think of here is when we see something so bright that we just have to look away. There's a reason that we don't look into the sun or we look away from blinding headlights at night. All right? We don't want the uh, potential damage that can come to our eyes from looking directly into the sun. We don't want the temporary blindness that accompany, accompanies looking into bright lights. This is a magnificent scene in front of us here. The appearance of Jesus' face changed. His clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. We, had, we, we were driving up this morning and we saw a flash of lightning. It's bright. To look at Jesus or to even be in his presence in this moment would be truly spectacular, something that we can't imagine. Jesus promised that he would return in glory, and here is a small glimpse of his glory. This is perhaps what he meant when he said that some standing there would not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Peter, John, and James are on hand to experience the glory of Jesus, which is typically veiled from us. Philippians 2, verses 5 and 8 is part of a passage that uh, talks about why we should imitate Christ's humility. And it says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, who in his nature is God, was made in human likeness and appeared like you and me as a human being. He made himself nothing, veiling his immense glory to not only walk among us, but to be a servant to us. A couple weeks ago, Pastor encouraged us by saying, humble yourself before God, surrender yourself to him. We have an example of humility where Jesus veiled his glory to appear to us as a man. He couldn't live among us as he was on the mountain in that moment. Why should we listen to Jesus? There's something special about him. His glory is from the kingdom of God, veiled in our presence because he had a mission to carry out. We get some insight into that, mis- into that mission as we pick back up in Luke chapter 9, verse 30. And it says, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. So not only is Jesus there in in all his glory, but Moses and Elijah have now appeared, also in glorious splendor. An amazing scene seemingly gets even more amazing. Why Moses and why Elijah there? Why did they show up? A common explanation for this is that Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. This makes sense. Let me throw a question out to you. What do you think of when you think of Moses? You can just call out some things. Ten Commandments, a leader, parting the sea. Those are all the things that I wrote down, right? So there's Moses telling Pharaoh, let my people go. He's the leader of the nation of Israel, the leader of the people. Uh, There's the crossing of the Red Sea. And of course, there are the Ten Commandments. And I know some of you have probably seen the movie with uh, Charlton Heston. I hope I said his name right. If you grew up in church, you likely know who Moses is. Moses proclaimed God's laws to the people, so it's reasonable to associate him with the law. 
Now, Elijah was known as a powerful prophet. He was so close with God that he was described as having walked with God. Can you imagine if somebody described you that way? Like that was a person that walked with God because of how close you were with him and how much you relied on him in your life. Scripture tells us that a chariot of fire and horses of fire came and took Elijah away to heaven. He did not taste death before experiencing glory with God. And here he appears in a scene revealing the glory of Jesus. He could be described as a forerunner to Jesus. Jesus himself proclaims that the promised Elijah has come through John the Baptist who prepared the way for Jesus. Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets is the simple explanation for why they were present. Moses, though, was not only a lawgiver, but Moses was a prophet himself. After Moses waited six days on the mountaintop, he spent 40 days and 40 nights with the Lord receiving the law. After coming down with the tablets, the words of God's covenant with his people, Moses' face was radiant and shining because he had spoken with the Lord. Later in his life, God told Moses that he would raise up a prophet like Moses who would have the words of God speaking of the Messiah who would come for the people. Elijah was not just a prophet, but relates to the law as well. He was used as a symbol of one who would come to turn the hearts of God's people back to his covenant. Each man would have been a highly respected figure in Jesus' day. So the fact that they are present draws attention to this moment. Jesus follows after Moses and Elijah and is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Because of the law, we are aware of our sin, and because of our sin, there's a consequence to be paid. And what we know this morning and what we're thankful for this morning is that Jesus stepped in and took that for us. He had tried to explain when he told the disciples that he must suffer greatly and die. Verse 31 says that they were talking about Jesus' departure. Exodus is the Greek word that's used there, which means departure. Jesus had to leave and transition out of this life for us to receive salvation. The use of Exodus, of course, alludes to the Old Testament Exodus led by Moses that saved God's people from the hand of Pharaoh. This departure encompasses his death and his resurrection, which we know are crucial to our salvation. His ascension to heaven following resurrection completed his departure. This departure, this exodus, was necessary to redeem us in the way that Moses redeemed the people of Israel in the exodus from Egypt. Jesus' departure being fulfilled at Jerusalem holds tremendous significance for us. His death and resurrection would pave the way to our salvation. Without that, we stand condemned. But because of Jesus and my friend Terrence's favorite verse, Romans 8.1, we now no longer stand condemned because of what Jesus did for us. But it was necessary for Jesus to do what he did to save us. Can you imagine this scene playing out? Jesus, Moses, and Elijah all talking about this mission that Jesus was on to save us. How lucky Peter, John, and James were to be there to witness this. They were probably hanging on every word, soaking it all in, taking notes, underlining, highlighting everything, marking down all the wonderful things that they were hearing, all the important things that they were hearing. Except, would it say, they were sleepy. Three titans of the faith are discussing the plans for salvation, and they are dozing off. Were they a little drowsy? Like, you know, when you take NyQuil and you're a little drowsy but still awake? Or did they actually fall asleep and then wake up? It's not entirely clear what happened. At the very least, though, they were far from alert during their conversation, or during this conversation between Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Can you imagine their reaction when they finally wake up, they're finally alert? Is that Moses and Elijah standing and talking with Jesus? What did we miss? I think about those days back in school when you're a little tired and maybe you stayed up a little too late the night before. Maybe you were bored. Whatever the reason, it seemed like you just couldn't find it within yourself to wake up and be fully alert. I'm sure Mr. Weaver saw some people fall. No, Mr. Weaver probably didn't see anybody falling asleep because he had him so captivated by his teaching. (laughs) But sometimes we struggle a little bit in class. Then the instructor says, This will be on the exam. All of a sudden, we're alert, we're wide awake, we're thinking, oh no, what did I miss? 
what will be on the exam? Hopefully it's going to be something that you're going to say now and not what you just said. Maybe our disciples were feeling this. What did I miss? I've never seen Jesus looking so radiant, so glorious. His face even looks different. He's with Moses. He's with Elijah. Am I seeing things? Is this real? I mentioned how Jesus took the disciples with him to pray prior to his arrest. Jesus, after praying, came back to them and asked, why are you sleeping? I'd want to ask them the same thing in this moment right here. Why are you sleeping? Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are there. Why are you sleeping? When they became fully awake, they saw his glory. There's a lesson in there for us. Sometimes we can ask ourselves, why are we sleeping? What is Jesus doing that we are missing? What is he saying that we're not hearing? When we become fully awake, that's when we see his glory. That's why we listen. Jesus has predicted his suffering a week earlier, and now he's discussing it with Moses and Elijah. And here we have the disciples not paying attention. Had they been paying attention, perhaps the next part of this scene would not have even happened at all. Pastor has mentioned a few times during this thing called faith series that Peter had the ability to stick his foot firmly in his mouth. Remember Jesus had to tell Peter, get behind me, Satan, as Peter objected to the coming suffering and death of Jesus Christ? Verse 33 begins to really push us to the heart of why we should listen to Jesus. It reads, as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. At first glance, this seems harmless. Why did Peter want to put up the shelters? Was he just trying to keep them all there? Right? This is probably a pretty cool experience. Maybe he wanted more since, you know, they slept for part of it and missed part of it. But this declaration feels important. In fact, if you read this Uh, In the New King James Version, it says, Then it happened that Peter said to Jesus. And it puts an emphasis on the word that, like something major is coming. It seems like his suggestion, though, was inappropriate based on the parentheses in the verse, pointing out that Peter didn't know what he was saying. Seems like Peter was often quick to speak without always realizing what he was saying. Because it was inappropriate, we have to consider the potential meaning of what he said. Peter's idea seems to suggest three equal shelters. Was he putting Jesus, Elijah, and Moses on equal footing? Let's read from Philippians 2, 9 to 11, picking up after talking about Jesus humbling himself to die on the cross. And it reads, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The glory of Jesus is revealed following his humble obedience. He has been exalted by God and his name is above every name. Moses was great. Elijah was great. But as great as they were, they were not the Messiah. Only Jesus has the way to everlasting life with the Father. So he's worth us listening to. Calling them equal would be problematic enough, but Peter also seems to ignore the fact that Jesus has something to accomplish. He has a mission. They can't stay there. The Messiah has a mission to fulfill. Peter, even after acknowledging that Jesus is the Messiah, still doesn't seem to understand the significance of Jesus predicting his death, predicting his suffering, predicting his resurrection. The significance of these three titans of the faith discussing Jesus' pending departure as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He didn't learn from Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan. It seems like Peter, and likely by extension the disciples, and probably by extension us, didn't fully get it. Even though Peter knew that Jesus was the Christ, he didn't understand the mission of Jesus. In verses 34 to 36, bring it home for why we should listen to Jesus. While he, Peter, was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. 
when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept the, this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. So God speaks directly to the disciples, commanding them to listen to Jesus. We must get out of the way of what God wants to accomplish and listen to Jesus. He was sent from God. Right? He has God's authority. Therefore, we must listen to him. He alone is the great prophet, the chosen servant, the son of God that the scriptures point to, that Moses and Elijah and all the prophets foretold for hundreds of years. He is our Lord and Savior. He is the promised Messiah. It's fitting that verse 36 says that after, Jesus, or after God had spoken, Jesus was alone. This passage focuses us on Jesus and his glory being above everything else. Why should we listen to Jesus? What is our motivation? Scripture points us to his glory. Scripture points us to his mission as the fulfillment of the salvation plan and his identity. He has direct authority from God. He is the son of God. He is God himself. So what do we do with that? Well, we do what God told us to do. We listen to him. We listen to Jesus. Does he have your attention or are you a little drowsy? Are you not alert? He must have your attention. He must be your priority. And we must do what he says. Listening goes beyond just hearing. I can hear and not listen. Listen, Listening often produces a response or an action. Listening to Jesus requires obedience to what he's told us. We've been talking about this thing called faith for the last few weeks. Listen to him when he says that those who do the will of his Father in heaven are his family. Challenge each other, encourage each other, love each other, and then go help our neighbors experience the mercy of God. Listen to him when he says, come to me. When we do, he has the peace of God waiting for us, waiting to experience his peace, his mercy, his grace, even if our problems don't go away. Listen to him when he says he will build upon the rock of faith. Trust in him. Remember, pastor's illustration, it's not until we sit on the stool that we've put our trust in that stool. Listen to him when he says, get behind me, Satan. Fill your mind with the things of God. Get out of the way so that God can accomplish his will in your life. Listen to him and pick up your cross daily. Are you willing to give everything that you are to God and follow him? Listen to him. Listen to the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the one who will leave the 99 to find the one, the one who has the power to say your faith has healed you, the one who said no more wine, no problem, the one who did not come to condemn the world but to save the world, the one who has gone to prepare a place for you, the one who is the vine through which we bear fruit, the one whose kingdom, whose glory is not of this world the one who finished the work that he came to do, the one who is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, the one who said he would suffer and that he would die, the one who said he would not stay down but would rise again on the third day, the one at whose whose name every knee should bow and every tongue should confess, and we will bow and we will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He is our Savior. He is our God. So why should we listen to Jesus? If there were ever reasons to listen to anyone, look no further than the one who's chosen by God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship you. Uh, We thank you for the ability to to adapt, the ability to be flexible and uh, deal with a power outage. And then things came back on. There's a lot of darkness out there in the world, Lord, just like we had darkness this morning. But just like we saw, there is light available. And the light came back. You are coming back. And we just pray that as we live our life, as we wait for you to return, that we would listen to you. That we would listen to the things that you have uh, commanded of us, the things that you have asked of us. Help us to grow closer to you as we become devoted devoted followers of Jesus. 
And Lord, help us to take that, to listen to you when you said to love your neighbor as yourself. Help us to take what we know and share it with those around us to help our neighbors experience your mercy. God, be with us today. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Invite our singers up to do our closing song. And you may stand. We come to our closing prayer, are things that definitely we can be praying for. There's still the war going on in Ukraine. Uh, there's families still grieving from school shootings, from other mass shootings here recently in our country. Uh, we pray for resolutions. We pray for safety of all. Uh, and also, we've been, oh, as, as most of you probably know, I'm a coach at, for Rantoul High School's football team. Uh, yesterday we went out and just did some cleanup in downtown um, and just to serve the community and to love the community. Uh, and, and as part of our outreach for the church, we've been, uh, this past week was our first week of football camp. Uh, Ron and Pastor were out to give out water to the kids after practice. Just a simple thing that we can do to love our community. Uh, we'll continue that throughout the summer. But pray for those kids uh, as they come through and take the water. We not only want them to have water to refresh themselves after practice, but we want them to have the living water as well that's only found through Jesus Christ. So please be praying for them. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, please be praying for our, our mission trip, uh, that we would get there safely and that we would be able to do uh, God's good work there. Let's pray. The Lord, we thank you again for this morning. We thank you for everything that you do for us. Uh, we ask that you would comfort uh, those who are, who are hurting, who've been experiencing some of the deepest tragedies imaginable uh, the last few weeks, the last few years, really, in our country. Uh, help us to find solutions to the, the things that plague our societies. Uh, Lord, we pray as well for the, the ongoing war in Ukraine, and we pray for the families there that are suffering as a result of that. And Lord, we pray for Rantoul. We pray for uh, the people that uh, live in this town, people that 
walk up and down and drive up and down the streets every day that need to know you. Help us be a part of that. Help us play whatever uh, role we can play in that. Uh, Help our teenagers to come to understand who you are, to come to know you, to come to love you, to come to embrace you. And Lord, whatever role we can play in that, um, help us see it and help us uh, embrace it. Lord, we thank you, we love you, in Jesus' name, amen. And now for our benediction, uh, I'll read from Numbers 6, as Pastor typically does for us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face upon you and give you his peace. Go in peace. Amen.